I'm going to start the broadcast. I still Well, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Doug McGowan with the City of Memphis, representing the Joint Task Force of Memphis and Shelby County today. I'm joined by the Director of the Health Department, Dr. Taylor, who will make some comments after me. I'd like to start today talking a little bit about vaccinations, and I just couldn't be more proud of our community. We're nearly 1.1 million vaccinations, actually, actually 1 million 74,000 as of today, and we've got about 56% of our population with at least one vaccination, almost 47% fully vaccinated. So we we are making progress. That's a lot of vaccinations, but we do have some more work to do. Um, uh, you know, and I know that you probably are already aware that there was a transition of the responsibility for public vaccinations from the city of Memphis uh, to Shelby County. And I'm pleased to report that that was a seamless transition yesterday at the Pipkin building at the other public vaccination sites. And so I hope uh, nobody saw any differences uh, in the services that were provided. And that's a testament to the hard work of everybody to make sure this is a seamless transition. Um, I've had the privilege of leading that effort for the city of Memphis uh, since February of this year. And I encourage everybody, if you haven't already, to read Mayor Strickland's update that he sent out via email earlier this week that thanked so many partners who were instrumental in making that a successful effort to this point. And I want to emphasize that this continues to be a community effort. We, can know, we cannot do this alone. The health department cannot do it alone. The city could not do it alone. And so I encourage all of you who are interested in helping to support, uh, we can certainly use your help. And I want to thank you for being supportive of us, and I hope that you'll offer Dr. Taylor that continued level of support. Uh, it's important for us that we continue to be successful. I'll take a point of personal privilege, and uh, I know the mayor has thanked so many partners Partners, but there really is a core team who are uh, very instrumental in making that happen, who were my support system, and that's uh, Chief Gina Sweat, Deputy Chief Angie Shelton, Deputy Chief Chris Wilson, Chief Ken Newton, Chief Eddie Roan, Chief Nick Molinaro, Lieutenant Kevin Spratlin, Administrator Greg Wayman, and Will Lively, uh, and Brandon Carpenter. They were the OEM team. Also, Lieutenant uh, Lee Gregory and Barry Nash, who did most of, most of our pharmacology. Lieutenant Lauren Farr and Nate Few, who did a lot of our scheduling. And Heather Fortner, who really helped coordinate the distribution of vaccine all across our community. And of course, Tiffany Collins and Takesha Tunstall, who coordinated the operations. That was the core team that worked uh, day and night, seven days a week in the early days of vaccinations. And I'm so thankful to have them on our team, as well as our friends at Regional One who continue to provide support uh, for the storage and distribution of our vaccination. We couldn't do it without them. And we're very thankful to have that wonderful institution here in our community. 
Uh, we did have some good partners at the state who continue to be supportive. Uh, Dr. Paul Peterson is just a wonderful partner who helped us make this transition. And Colonel Jason Glass, who helped us with the implementation of the FEMA effort that we had last spring here. So Jason and Paul, I really appreciate your efforts. One thing I do want to call attention to that many people do not know is that many of the vaccinators have been volunteers. And most of those volunteers came from our nursing, medical, and respiratory therapy schools, as well as some of our dental schools. And everybody was involved, the University of Memphis, University of Tennessee Health Science Center, Baptist College of Health Sciences, Union University, Christian Brothers University, and Southwest Tennessee Community College. Um, we have a lot to be proud of in this community. We came together and we've done that. And again, I will encourage everybody to continue with that momentum as Dr. Taylor and her team lead us from the front. Um, I'm also especially proud of uh, the students at University of Memphis and the University of Memphis Research Foundation who have done 138,000 phone calls to this point. They've spoken with 74,000 people encouraging them to get vaccinated and providing them with the information that was necessary for testing and vaccination, and combined with our door-to-door -door campaign, who've now visited more than 37,000 homes and provided information, I think we're getting information out to everybody where and when they need it so that they can make the right decision for themselves and for their families. And so that work of the door-to-door -door campaign will continue through December. Uh, we are bringing to a close uh, the call uh, center that we have with UMRF because we have, quite frankly, exhausted the list of people to call. Um, so uh, if you haven't been called, um, that just means either we don't have your number, but uh, we've called everybody who we have a number for. Uh, the last thing I'll say is that the only thing that has materially changed is who is responsible for the public vaccinations, and Dr. Taylor and her team are going to carry that work forward. But the Joint Task Force work continues unabated. Uh, we have representatives from every city in this county. We have representatives from cities outside this county. We have representatives from the counties surrounding Shelby County. All of the school systems, both public and private, all of the hospital systems, the universities, and so many other partners uh, that support this work. That work continues unabated, and we will continue to do that work until we are convinced that we are in a safe place with this pandemic. So I just want you to be confident that we are still here paying attention. We're monitoring what happens, and I know we'll have some words about Omicron, which we don't know much about yet, uh, but we are waiting and preparing uh, for that next wave should it come. So with that, I'll bring my comments to a close, and I'll turn it over to Dr. Taylor. Thanks, Chief McGowan. I'm gonna start off with some slides today. Total COVID-19 cases reported today, one, to date, 149,410. New cases reported today, 176. That is up from 131 cases reported this time last week, and the 137 cases we reported two weeks ago. The seven-day average of cases per day is now 104. That is down from the 126 average this time last week. Next slide. The seven-day average test positivity rate is now 5.9%, which is up from 3.3% this time last week. Next slide. The effective reproductive number, or RT, of the virus is now 1.01, a slight decrease from 1.06 reported last week. An RT greater than one indicates that each case is infecting more than one other person, meaning that the epidemic may be growing rather than shrinking in the community. Total COVID-19 hospitalizations as of December 1st, 107, with 29 in the ICUs and 78 in acute care. Next slide. This chart shows the confirmed cases per 100,000 population for the area surrounding the Memphis metro area. As you can see, Shelby County is the lowest curve in blue, and that has remained consistent over time. And I would re be remiss if I didn't repeat what Chief McGowan said, that that's a direct result of the partnership that we've continued to have here in Shelby County. Next slide. 
The next few slides are comparisons between Shelby County's case rates and other counties, metro counties in the state. Shelby County has a case rate of 10.4 cases per 100,000, a test positivity rate of 5.9%, and a vaccination rate of 47.3%. Compared to Knox County that has 18.9 per cases per 100,000, a test positivity rate of 8.2%, and a vaccination rate fully vaccinated of 55.1%. Next slide. When you compare Shelby County to Hamilton County, Hamilton County has 15.4 cases per 100,000, a test positivity rate of 9.1%, and a vaccination rate of 51.7%. Next slide. And when you compare Shelby County to Davidson County, Davidson County has a case rate of 13.5 cases per 100,000 and a test positivity rate of 5.4% with a vaccination rate of 58.9%. Next slide. Shelby County has lower active case rates than every other metro area in Tennessee, despite having the lowest percentage of population fully vaccinated of the metros. Next slide. Currently, there are 1,184 active cases in Shelby County, and that is only a slight increase from the 1,182 active cases last week. There have been 2,342 fatalities over the course of the pandemic. This slide shows active cases by age. We have seen a marked decrease in active cases among the youngest age group, ages 0 to 17, over the last week, and a slight increase in the active cases in the 25 to 34 year old age group, 55 to 64 year age group, and the 85 plus age group. Next slide. You're familiar with this slide. This is the active cases by zip code in areas that are darker in color indicate that those areas have more active cases uh, per 100,000 in their zip code. Next slide. This map shows the same thing, but it is active pediatric cases by zip code. Next slide. This chart shows the first, second, and third doses by date with the third doses in darker blue. More than one million vaccines, which Chief McGowan shared in Shelby County, have now been received uh, as at least one dose of vaccine. Our goal is to increase the number of first and second doses in order to meet our vaccination goal. Next slide. This graph shows the ages of the vaccinated population, and you'll notice that the age with the highest vaccination rate is 65 to 74 year age group, with 77.7% .7 fully vaccinated. Great job. 9.7% of our children in Shelby County, ages 5 to 11, have now received at least one dose, and if you're looking for raw numbers, that is 8,985 of our five to 11 year olds in the county. Next slide. Currently, 55.9% of the eligible population has received at least one dose of vaccine. 47.3% of the population overall is fully vaccinated, having completed their series of two vaccinations or more. The goal that we set at the beginning of vaccinations was to have at least 70% of the population fully vaccinated in Shelby County. You see we are more than halfway there, but we still have a way to go. So, as of December 1st, 523,966 people have received at least one dose of vaccine, 349,971 have received two doses, and 93,001 people have received a third or additional dose of vaccine. That is the end of those slides. The Pipkin Building is providing vaccinations for those age 12 and older on a drive through basis as it has been doing under City of Memphis control and now transition to Shelby County from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. Tuesday through Friday. It will be closed this Saturday, December 4th due to an event at the Liberty Bowl. It remains open until December 15th. The Germantown Baptist vaccination site is open Tuesdays and Fridays from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. offering drive-through vaccinations for ages 12 and older. This site will close after December 17th.
The Health Department's Immunization Clinic at 814 Jefferson is open Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. and offers vaccinations for ages five and older, no appointment needed. And please remember, for those of you bringing your minor children less than 18 years old to be vaccinated at the Health Department's Immunization Clinic or at one of the drive through sites if they are 12 and over, you will need some type of proof of age of those individuals. Either a birth certificate or a shot record will do. And I want to just repeat what Chief McGowan said. Please note that this is what a seamless transition looks like. We are so appreciative of all of our continued community partners because we are honestly in this together and we cannot do this by ourselves. No one agency or entity can make sure that we continue to protect the health of Shelby County residents. And with that, I will start off the questions. Abigail Warren, Daily Memphian. Hi, I know uh, two weeks ago when we talked, you said that the uh, fully vaccinated um, definition had not changed yet. Is that, are you all talking about changing that? And then I also wanted to see if there are um, any enforcement measures you'll take on any of the schools. Thank you. So the first question, if we are talking about changing the definition, I will remind you that any definitions that change will come out of either the FDA or the CDC. And of course, we will receive that information from them through the Tennessee Department of Health. So if that definition changes, we will definitely let you know. For the second question, enforcement in the schools, as you know, we are under a federal order right now to enforce our health directive for schools that are covered by the Americans with Disabilities Act. So because we are under that order, we are required to enforce our health directive. That one was just renewed yesterday. And what we are doing is that if we do receive reports of violations of that order, we have an investigation team that goes out, investigates the report, uh, also continues to investigate any positive COVID cases within schools. And then if a school is found to be in violation, they receive a violation letter reminding them of the federal court order. Okay, are you all quarantining students or is that the responsibility of the Tennessee Department of Health? That is the responsibility of the Tennessee Department of Health, but students who are found to be COVID positive are still required to be in isolation once they are found to be positive. Dominique Dillon, Fox 13. Hello, with the new um, health directive renewed, I see that uh, you guys mentioned that wearing masks indoors is highly recommended. Depending on if cases continue to rise and uh, the new variant, could, any of, could the directive be updated and um, could people uh, act, will there be more than, um, let's see, could people be reprimanded or how will it be enforced? Great question. So what I will tell you is that, um, and I've said this all along, no tools are ever off the table, but as you know, uh, state legislation has changed what we are able to do without permission uh, for the short term. So what I would tell you is first, remember that Del the Delta variant is still very much prevalent in our community, and our labs are on the lookout for any sequencing that points to us having any Omicron variant cases in our community. With that said, no matter what variant is predominant, it's still very much important to have your mask on, especially in indoor public places when you are not sure of the vaccination status or the illness status of the people around you. That's just good, solid practice, whether there is a requirement in place or not. And so that is what the Joint COVID Task Force has continued to hammer home every single time Time, that people should be doing everything they can to protect themselves. And that includes masking up, that includes getting everyone vaccinated who is eligible. And for right now, that's everyone five and up. And then also as a follow-up, the slight increase that we've seen in COVID cases, do you believe that's a result of gatherings from Thanksgiving? And um, do you expect this 
to see more increases from Thanksgiving and how could that affect uh, Christmas? Well, the good news is, is that the RT has remained pretty steady right there at that one uh, benchmark, um, which means that we are seeing a bit of acceleration, but not much. And the seven day rolling average has remained around 100 and it's bounced up and down a bit. Um, and so really, uh, if we were gonna see any increases, it'd probably be another week out from Thanksgiving before we saw that. And for right now, we're just a week out. So we're monitoring it daily, um, but we're also reminding people that as we go into uh, the next holidays that are going on or will be going on, make sure that when you're gathering, you know your status. There are four mass testing sites still in the county, and then there are several other places where you can get a test, and there are several retailers where you can get a rapid test. So with that in mind, everybody should know their status going into any holiday gathering that they will be going to over the next month. Um, it's just good sound practice, once again, to know if you're positive, because if you are positive for COVID, then you know you should be staying home, away from other people, and making sure that you don't spread any illness to others. Katherine Burgess, Commercial Appeal. Hey, hope you're all doing well today. Um, I'm wondering if you have any expectation for when um, the Omicron variant will hit Memphis, and if there is anything different that people should do when it does hit, um, other than the protections they've already been taking uh, for previous iterations of the virus. Thanks, Catherine. So we are hoping that we will not be the first city in the state of Tennessee to see an Omicron case. But as you know, uh, we are an urban area and people travel in and out of here all of the time. And our residents travel all over the world all of the time. And so we are monitoring that very closely. The Joint COVID Task Force has been in continuous talks about the possibility and making making sure that everybody who is already a great partner is aware that this may become um, an issue, but we're also preparing um, to make sure that if we do see a case or even a cluster, that we're prepared to protect people as much as possible, to isolate, to quarantine, to do the things we know work. So when you ask about any new things to do, no, the message is the same. We know that vaccination is our premium way to get out of this pandemic. And now we can vaccinate anybody who's eligible down to the age of five. That's huge, that's already a game changer and we know parents are taking advantage of it. But if you know other people in your community, in your family, if it's you that is eligible and has still not been vaccinated or say you got your first dose, but still are on the fence about that second dose, or you just haven't had a chance to run out and get your booster, now is the time to do it. And when you run out to get that booster, make sure you're masked up if you know you're going to be in a public space where you're not going to know the vaccination status of other people. Um, my second question, is the health department considering reinstating the mask mandate in light of Omicron? Um, and if, um, regardless of whether or not you're considering it, um, does the health department um, believe it has the authority to even reinstate the mask mandate? So like I shared earlier, our authority has changed given the present state uh, legislation. But what I will tell you is that no tools are off the table. And just because we may not have the authority to issue a mass requirement before talking to the Tennessee Department of Health, we continue to be in constant communication with the Tennessee Commissioner of Health and the Department of Health to make sure that we're doing everything possible to protect the health of Shelby County residents and we use a data-driven approach. So if we're looking at the data now and we've decided that now is not the time to issue a mass re requirement or even ask for permission to issue a mass requirement, if the data changes and we feel like we need to do that, we will take the necessary process steps to do so. Hannah Grabenstein, MLK 50. 
Good afternoon. Um, I'm wondering if, uh, I'm not really sure the best way to phrase this, I'm basically wondering if the data over the past week are, um, should, we, should we take it with any caveats given Thanksgiving, um, you know, are people getting tested less or more or there were days off and reporting, you know, is it just a little bit fuzzier with the noise? Hannah, you always have the best questions. Uh, and so actually before I came here, I was talking to our chief of epidemiology. And so she got this answer ready, especially for you. So testing volume actually did go down over the Thanksgiving holiday. And so what you're seeing in that rise in test positivity rate is probably a result of that. Not to get in too much into the weeds, but as you know, if a denominator is smaller, then and that percentage sometimes can go up. So, because you have less people getting tested, and so it looks like there are more positives. With that said, the main thing to remember is that we still have COVID-19 circulating in our community. And that means that everybody who is within the sound of my voice, Chief McGowan's voice, and anybody else in this public health space who has been talking about how to protect yourself should be using those measures as much as possible. Super, thank you, um, and thank you. Uh, I also am wondering, um, now that we're sort of in the midst of flu season, I know there were anecdotes about RSV circulating at higher rates. Mm -hmm. we, are we, like, how, is, how are other respiratory viruses looking in the community, um, and are people getting immunized against the flu? Great question. We do have a steady stream of people getting immunized against the flu, mainly because um, we know that people can get their flu shot and their COVID shot at the same time, and that's making it even more convenient for people to get vaccinated. And then we know that people are hearing the news about a new variant, and folks are starting to take advantage of the fact that if they are eligible and they have not been vaccinated yet, they need to get vaccinated. So we are seeing that people are protecting themselves even more. We haven't necessarily seen an uptick in flu in the community, but as I've shared previously, that has a lot to do with some of the mitigation efforts that we've been encouraging people to continue because of COVID-19. It doesn't just protect you from COVID-19, it protects you from all of those other viruses in the community circulating as well. Those are all of our questions today. Any closing messages? Oh, actually we have one more. Um, Katie Reardon, WKNO. Hi, thanks for letting me squeak in. Um, hi, Dr. Taylor, you're welcome hi. to answer this for Chief McGowan. Um, but I'm curious, is the, with Chief McGowan's announcement that they're ending the, the phone banks and that these mm. mass vaccination sites are gonna close at the end of, or the middle of this month, is that signaling something? Um, has the county sort of reached a limit to what it can do to convince the unconvincible? And so when you talk about still reaching that 70% goal, what, what tools are left? So I'm going to answer and then I'm going to let Chief McGowan come up and answer as well. So when you say convince the unconvincible, I am I'm a glass half full type of person. So I'm not going to call them unconvincible. I'm going to call them in pre-contemplation mode. And so no, they get, it's Chief McGowan like that. Uh, so no. The county has not reached its limit in protecting people from COVID-19. And so, as we've shared many, many times before, the Joint COVID Task Force is here, it's working, it's communicating, it's made up of partners across all sectors in the county, and it has one goal, to make sure that as many people who are eligible to be protected are protected, and to make sure that as many people who wanna know their status can get their status when it comes to COVID-19. And we have put in place a partnership that will continue that well into the future, however long we're dealing with COVID-19. And I think that's an important point to make. Chief McGowan made it earlier. We are in this together until everybody's safe, nobody's safe. And so that's the other thing people need to understand. We can vaccinate down to age five. So if you know an eligible person who hasn't been vaccinated, this is the best time, if you haven't already done it, to come out and get that done because we have all the resources at their disposal to make that happen. And I'll turn it over to Chief McGowan. Thanks, Dr. Taylor. And, and that, it is a great question, but 
I will say emphatically, no. There is no signal here. Uh, I just want to hit a couple of points. Number one, it's important for us to document for the public what we are doing. Um, we had questions very early on, well, what are y'all doing? Have you thought of this and could you do that? What I'm reporting to you is the things that we have done. We have gone door to door to knock on doors. We've now knocked on 37,000 doors. We're running out of neighborhoods to knock on doors. Uh, we've called more than 150,000 telephone numbers and spoken with 74,000 people. We have run out and exhausted the list. That doesn't mean the work is done. It means we pivot to something different. I know Dr. Taylor will tell you that, as we mentioned, the Pipkin Building is planning to close its doors on the 15th. Largely, we know demand will go down during the holidays. We can understand there's some other events happening over there. The, we have a wonderful uh, bowl game that happens over there. But rest assured that should the demand peak and should there be more need to do that, we'll open the doors again um, for people to get vaccinated, whether it's at the Pipkin or another public site. Uh, this is the normalization of vaccination. Just as we had the normalization of testing, you'll recall early in the pandemic, the public testing sites were really the only place you could get your test until it became more prevalent, more pharmacies, more laboratories, the hospitals, other clinics were able to test for COVID. We reduced the number and the throughput at the public testing sites because it became normalized. Vaccinations are now relatively normalized. Uh, you can get them at most pharmacies. You can get them at many clinics. Pediatric clinics are now coming into the fore with their ability to do vaccinations. And so the public vaccinations, this is how it ebbs and flows. We come together, we have high volume testing, we have high volume vaccinations, and then we normalize the distribution through what would be considered normal distribution channels. So there is no signal here. We are standing by and ready to respond to the demand. I will come back to the testing. What Dr. Taylor mentioned is it's important to know your status. Go in and get a rapid test if you're going to gather. Even better, go get a PCR test at one of our drive through sites. It's free. It's easy. It's no cost to you. It may not be free to your insurance company, but it's no cost to you. Um, and it's important for you to know your status. We still have plenty of capacity. Today, there are people, as we are speaking, waiting for you to go get your test. So please take advantage of that. The one thing I would like to share is if you want to get a test, please do not go to an emergency room to get a test. Um, go to your provider, go to one of our drive through sites. What we haven't talked about in a while is hospitalizations. There are still more than 100 people in the hospital with COVID. That's 100 hospital beds that are not available for people with other maladies, and we don't need to increase the number of people there. So the work continues. Our hospitals are still very busy. Our nurses, doctors, nursing assistants, respiratory therapists are all incredibly busy and very tired. Please do not add to their workload unnecessarily by taking an unnecessary trip to the ER or asking for a test from the ER, but I'll wrap up by saying there is no message here. This is the normalization of work. We are still committed. The task force is here, and we will do what we believe is in the best interest of the community to make sure we meet that with the resources appropriate to the conditions on the ground. So with that, we thank you. Hope everybody had a wonderful Thanksgiving. Know your status before you gather. Make that part of your holiday planning. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.